Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Heather Harrington, and on behalf of the program committee, we are very pleased to have uh, Jeremy Ganawadena from Harvard Medi Medical School in the Department of Systems Biology. Um, so Jeremy did his undergraduate at Imperial College London, and then did in mathematics, and then did a PhD in algebraic topology uh, at, at Cambridge. And then he spent time at Chicago and Trinity before joining HP Labs, where he spent 14 years there running uh, Blue Skies, their Blue Skies research program, and basic research uh, in mathematical sciences. In 2002, though, he came back to academia and joined Harvard, where he's been at Harvard Medical School um, since then. So uh, Jeremy's main um, focus has been studying cellular decision making and information processes. And there's a number of contributions that um, he's made, but just a few to highlight. Uh, you'll remember in Alicia's talk, she gave an uh, introduction to some of these uh, post-translational modification systems, these biochemical systems. And Jeremy has, um, has provided insight and understanding to, to this system with his rational parameterization theorem, uh, the geometry of uh, these multi-site systems, introduced steady state invariance, computing Grobner bases, but then also uh, getting around that with his linear complex, um, complex linear invariance, which doesn't require Grobner bases. And he was also very inspiring. It was the first time that I had read a paper with Grobner bases and um, these molecular, um, molecular biology models. So he uses a, a combination of pure, pure mathematics, computation, and, um, and the yeah, theoretical computation um, and applied mathematics all together to study complex systems of which uh, biology offers many interesting problems. So we're going to hear a little bit about that today. Please welcome Jeremy. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, Heather, thanks for the introduction. And uh, thank you to uh, Jan and the organizers for keeping all the moving parts going. It's been an impressive feat of organization, so thank you. And Sandra and Carolyn, thank you so much for the invitation. It came as a surprise. Uh, but uh, uh, I feel I've been away from the mathematical fold for a long time, living in biology. Uh, and it feels a little bit like coming home. Although I have to say, remembering what John's comment was at the start of the conference about him feeling uneasy because you know he was introducing his uh, girlfriend to his parents, I kind of know how he feels. So, yeah. OK. so. Um, so, uh, so, so this is what I'm going to try and, and, and talk about um, today, just a, a brief uh, um, uh, summary of uh, the topic. So we'll, we'll begin, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something about gene regulation, because I expect not everyone will be aware of the context here. So um, tell you a little bit about the sort of biological background, and then I want to focus on the problem of energy expenditure, which uh, is the issue that I really want to try and dig into here, and the concept of um, um, a hot field barrier, which um, I'll try and explain. It's a, it's a sort of thread that runs through this talk. Um, and then we'll then talk about um, the particular problem that I want to focus on as an example, the issue of sharpness in the expression of a gene. And then we'll take a little pause. Um, and say a few words about um, the kind of approach that we're taking in bringing mathematics to biology here. And, and this is an issue that causes lots of fuss and bother. Um, and I think uh, it might be helpful to just say how we're trying to do it. And then we'll get into the mathematics. And I'll tell you about the particular approach that we've been taking to doing this. We call it the linear framework. And use that to uh, show you a Hopfield barrier for sharpness. And then we'll finish up with some of the challenges, the mathematical and, as you see, also challenges in physics that arise. So, so one of the threads through this, which perhaps um, is a little different from some of the things we've been hearing about, is, is the role that physics is playing here, uh, as you'll see. Okay? So don't hesitate to interrupt, wave your hands, shout, 
uh, at any point, okay? All right, so gene regulation. Um, so Watson and Crick figured out the structure of DNA, and it told us um, remarkable things about the process of heredity and how um, genes could be encoded in DNA, but it also left a problem, which Alicia uh, pointed out in her talk, which is that all the cells in our body have essentially the same genome. So how is it that a liver cell and a brain cell and a muscle cell are so different? And the answer that we give now is that, well, they express different sets of genes, and that's why they do different things. So how is it that they come to express different sets of genes, given that they've all got the same genes? And the answer to that uh, was figured out more or less in parallel with some of the work that Crick and Watson were doing. And the answer is that DNA actually contains two kinds of information. One kind of information is the information to um, express a gene. It's the coding DNA. Um, and the other bit of information Regulatory DNA is information in the sequence that tells the machinery in the cell whether or not and, in fact, how to express a gene. And there's actually two parts to that information. One is the information in the DNA sequence, and the other is the information in proteins that have the ability to detect specific DNA sequences and bind to them. And these DNA-specific binding uh, proteins are called transcription factors. OK, so here we see, if you like, the sort of key parts of the process of gene regulation, transcription factors which have the ability to find specific sites on DNA. And then there's a whole lot of stuff in the middle, which we'll come to in a moment, the machinery that eventually leads to the expression of coding DNA into messenger RNA and then ultimately into protein. Now, you'll notice that there's a sort of hidden recursiveness in what I just said. Because how does this protein come into being? Well, it's got its coding DNA, it's got its regulatory DNA, and so on. <laughs> so before long, you get entangled in the fundamental recursiveness of life. Uh, and this is something that biologists try to avoid dealing with. So, and we're going to follow suit by basically doing what engineers do when they encounter recursive systems, which they cut the loop, and they look at it as an open loop problem. And so we're going to focus not on the overall system, but on what happens at a specific gene and how transcription factors influence the production of the mRNA. So we're going to look at it as an input-output problem by focusing on that, but there's all this recursiveness there in the background. Okay. So, if you read the textbooks, um, the working out of, um, of all this is attributed usually to Jacques Monod and Francois Jacob, who were working in the bacterium E. coli. Um, and that's true. But uh, Barbara McClintock, who was working in the much more recalcitrant organism of maize, or corn, it's a plant, much more difficult to work with, much more interesting. Um, uh, had worked out most of the details of this, and particularly the distinction between regulatory and coding DNA, before Mono and Jacob. And she was well aware of the relationships between this. And it's a kind of historical, I don't know, accident that her contribution to this story has essentially been forgotten. Now, she's, of course, uh, you know, acknowledged as uh, one of the great scientists, great biologists of the 20th century, but for her discovery of something completely different, which is transposons, or parasitic elements in the genome, which she worked out in maize, amazingly. Um, and she was awarded a Seoul Nobel Prize, 1983, I think, for that discovery. Uh, but, but her other discovery has somehow got lost from the historical record. Um, so I mentioned this not only because I like fixing mistakes in the historical record, but it also kind of illuminates two other points. One is there's a lot of commonality to what happens in bacteria and what happens in higher organisms, as we say, eukaryotes. Um, and their work illuminated this. So you have transcription factors in all organisms. You have the machinery that turns coding DNA into messenger RNA. But there's also a huge difference 
between bacterial organisms and eukaryotic organisms. And that was something that McClintock, back in her day, saw much more clearly than anyone else, and which we're now coming back to focus on. Okay? So uh, this is just a picture to uh, take that story a little bit further of how different the bacterial and eukaryotic contexts are. And uh, we don't want to get too deeply into this, but um, uh, the, the major differences here are that in the bacterial cell, DNA is basically bare. It is not enclosed in a surrounding compartment as it in is in eukaryotes, where there's a membrane-bound compartment called the, the nucleus that contains the DNA. Um, and the process of transcriptional regulation is kind of local uh, in the sense of the DNA sequence. The regulatory information, the binding sites for transcription factors are pretty close to where the coding DNA is located. And although the DNA is kind of wound around in three dimensions, essentially most of the activity happens local in the 1D sequence of the DNA. And what happens when you move to eukaryotes is all of that gets blown out of the water. Um, what you see is that the nucleus itself is highly hierarchical and dynamically organized. DNA does not occur bare, but it's wound around protein cores called nucleosomes. Uh, and that is part of how roughly three meters of DNA gets packed into a 10 micron nucleus in a human cell. Okay. Um, and the uh, um, rather local, compact picture that we see in bacteria is exploded here on both sides. The coding DNA is broken up into fragments, which have to be stitched together, splicing. And the uh, transcription factor binding sites are now strewn all over the genome in little compact clusters called enhancers. Okay, so, and there's a huge amount of machinery that... Okay, what was that? Sorry. Did that cursor move or did I just... Okay, all right. Hmm, this is your laptop, right? Okay. Um, okay, so there's a lot of machinery in the middle which we won't get into, but I want to draw your attention to sort of two points that are important here. Um, one is this problem of integrating the information. How does all this information, little bits of information strewn all over the genome, get integrated into the decision uh, to do something with this gene? But the other point, the one I really want to focus on, is that there's a huge amount of energy being expended in the eukaryotic genome, which you don't see in the bacterial genome. And that energy is in the way of moving nucleosomes around, disassembling them, repacking chromatin, and also putting these marks that you might see here on these nucleosomes and other proteins. These marks are the same marks that Alicia was talking about in her talk. They're post-translational modifications. And all of these are energy-consuming biochemical reactions. So what's the deal with energy here? I mean, energy in some sense, we all know that energy is essential for life. We have a lot of molecular understanding of the processes of energy transduction. But what we haven't had is a sense of how that energy plays out in information processing. And the person who first uh, really uh, had an insight into this is the physicist John Hopfield. And back in the day when I um, got interested in biology, my biological colleagues said, you have to read this paper of Hopfield's. This was an <coughs> exemplar of how mathematical theory gave insight into biology. And I duly did. And it's a really interesting paper. Um, what was he trying to do? So at the time he was working, people had first started to uh, measure the error rates that are involved in copying DNA or in translating a, um, mRNA into protein or transcribing a gene into mRNA. And these error rates, say for replication of DNA, are incredibly low. There's something like one in 10 to the nine. And Hopfield, did a back of the envelope calculation and decided that what he could explain on the basis of um, uh, sort of not invoking energy was one in 10 to the four. And he was trying to figure out how you get an error rate that's almost twice 
two orders of uh, uh, several orders of magnitude bigger than that, right? A squared, at least a square. And he came up with this idea, which is basically that the process of discrimination takes two bytes at the problem. And he uh, wrote this up in a, this very simple model. You have a correct and an incorrect substrate and some mechanism that is detecting them, the difference between them, and the basic way you start to detect a difference is by binding and unbinding, and usually it's the unbinding rate that determines whether something is correct or not. A correct substrate stays bound for longer, right? So what Hopfield said was, well, suppose that you have an error rate of epsilon for one binding, why not give two bindings? So you have two bytes of the cherry. So you get epsilon with one and epsilon with the other, and therefore you get an epsilon squared. Okay, what's the energy doing here? So when I first read this paper, um, he's doing all this algebra, and he comes to this little, this, this line where he derives this formula, and for the life of me, I couldn't figure out how this formula, how he's getting this, and it's just algebra. Okay, and so I went to all the colleagues who had told me to read this paper, and I said, yeah, how does he do this? And nobody could enlighten me. Okay, so in the end I got so frustrated I just put it aside and I said, okay, well, you know, that's life, and got on with things. And 10 years later in the lab, when we started finally to start thinking about energy, I figured out what was going on. And um, so as mathematicians, we tend to, to use the word equilibrium, fixed point, to mean steady state. Don't do that with physicists. <laughs> okay. so. Hopfield's argument was a steady state argument, so he's assuming that dx dt is zero. But physicists know that there are two kinds of steady states. Right? There's a steady state of thermodynamic equilibrium. And what that means is that you have a system which can exchange heat with its surroundings, but is otherwise closed. There is no matter flowing through the system. In that case, physics says that that system attains a state of thermodynamic equilibrium at which magic happens. And the magic is expressed by uh, these terms, detailed balance, microscopic reversibility. We'll come to uh, say what those are in a moment. But an intuitive way of thinking about it is if you take a movie of the microscopic behavior, it looks the same going forwards or backwards. You can't tell the arrow of time. And that's what doesn't happen when you're in a steady state that's away from equilibrium, which is now an open system. It's connected to some sources and sinks in the background. And there's some potential here, it's gravitational potential, but it could be chemical potential in the case of the cell. And in this case, you can detect the difference between forwards and backwards, there is an arrow of time. So, um, so, so another way of looking at this, which will come out of what we're gonna talk about, is this idea of path independence and path dependence. And this, I think, is the most helpful way to understand what Hopfield was doing here. You see, there is a way of calculating the steady state probability of the exit state in this Markov process. And that's really the difference between that probability for the correct substrate and the incorrect substrate is what tells you the error rate. And the problem at thermodynamic equilibrium is that the steady state probability of this does not depend on the path you take to get there. You can calculate it using a path, and the answer you get is the same no matter what path you take. So at equilibrium, the system can't tell it's taken two bites of the cherry. And so what Hopfield realized is the only way to do that is to inject energy into this link here, break detail balance, microscopic reversibility, and now the system is able to, it's sensitive to the fact that there are two possible paths for reaching it. And now you get an improved error correction. Now there's some fine print in that because it's a balance between the two parts and we get into that here using the methods I'm gonna talk about, but that's the basic idea here that you need the energy to enforce this path dependence that takes place away from thermodynamic equilibrium. Okay, so this brought home many things. This is, this is actually the point that I didn't understand. Uh, so Hopfield, writing in 1974, basically assumed that everyone would know what detailed balance was. So what that told me was I needed to learn some physics. Um, so, um, and it also brought home the fact that there's something more going on here. I think what Hopfield saw here was really significant in the context of this particular kind of information processing, but it actually tells us it's a, it's a, it's a message to us about a much more powerful statement that we could make uh, 
about um, what goes on during cellular information processing. And this is this idea of the Hopfield barrier, which I've tried to write down here. I think this is what's at work in any cellular information processing. That if the mechanism that's undertaking it is operating at thermodynamic equilibrium, there's a limit to how well it can achieve this. And the only way to get past this limit, this limit is the, what we call the Hopfield barrier, is to take the system away from equilibrium, maintain it away from equilibrium, and then, in principle, you can do, as Hopfield showed, as good as you want. Now, I don't know of any uh, statement or proof of something like this in the generality that I've stated it. If you, if you show this to a physicist, and there are probably some in the audience, they say, yeah, of course. Um, and what we use it as is a kind of um, program for going back into molecular biology and trying to rethink the way in which the various processes are using energy from this perspective to actually try to clarify what are the um, quantitative measures of information processing and what are the barriers involved here. Okay, so um, I just wanted to point out that there's a lot of subtlety under the hood here as to how energy gets used in the cell. And the thing you might think when someone says, well, there's lots of energy going on in the cell, is that actually the energy is just used to get over a barrier. Um, and it's not really being used to maintain the steady state. And what I'm going to talk about today is, is this, the possibility that the energy is being used to maintain the steady state, as Hopfield was talking about. But I think there's a very interesting set of questions to do with what's going on in the transient regime and whether there is, in fact, some kind of transient Hopfield barrier, fundamental limitation to the kind of information processing that you can do when you're in the transient regime. And, and we don't know the answer. And we, we suspect from some of the things that we're looking at that there is such a, a barrier, but we don't have a story there yet. So I'm going to focus on the steady state, but this is one of the difficulties of trying to get at this problem in the cell, because when you see energy, what's it being used for? Maybe there isn't a steady state. Okay. All right, so this is the system that we're going to take a look at. Um, it's um, a particular um, example that started us thinking about uh, these issues. And um, what I'm showing you here is a fruit fly embryo. Um, and the blue stain that you see there, this is the front, this is the back, anterior, posterior. Um, this um, uh, uh, blue uh, stain that you're seeing there is the expression of a particular gene called hunchback. And what you notice, so the fruit fly has been the sort of uh, model organism for understanding the development of the body plan. And although it's an invertebrate, there are lots of shared characteristics with the way we, vertebrates, develop our body plan. And in particular, what you're seeing here is the starting point of segmentation. So animals have segmented structures, and this, uh, this is the starting point for the elaboration of the segments of the insect. And what you notice here is this extremely, well, it's, it's a very sharp boundary between the expression of this gene being on and, and being off. And what you see from this is that the, uh, uh, the way this is thought to work is that this is regulated, this expression of hunchback is regulated by a protein that's a transcription factor called bicoid. This is actually a transcription factor that comes from the mother. The mother breaks the symmetry by giving the embryo uh, mRNAs that are prepackaged. And this is maternal transcription factor. And this transcription factor um, is very high at the anterior end and falls off in a roughly exponential way across the embryo. And what we think is happening is that there's a threshold when the concentration drops below a certain point, it switches off hunchback. And there's a very, very narrow window of bicoid concentration in which this happens. And this is sharpness. So sharpness is, how is it that a small change in the concentration of the transcription factor has a big impact on the output of the gene? And if you um, stain for both of these uh, proteins, you can actually construct a functional relationship between bicoid, suitably normalized, and hunchback and it has this sort of S-shaped form, and it's extremely well fitted to something which is called a Hill function. Some of you may know about this, but this is a class of functions that are often used to fit data 
and in particular, this kind of S-shaped sigmoidal data. And when Archibald Vivian Hill introduced the Hill function um, 100 years ago, sorry, I went a bit too far, um, he uh, very carefully said that he was introducing this function purely to fit data. It had no biophysical meaning, all right? And it fits data very well, and it's been used for 100 years from that perspective. And as you see, this, uh, this uh, coordinate, this uh, parameter here, h, the Hill coefficient, comes out to about five for, for this particular realm. So what we're trying to understand here is um, how does this come about? What is the mechanism responsible for this? Okay. So I just wanted to, to um, um, have a, a little interlude to, to point out something about the way we're approaching this. So um, there's a lot of kind of controversy about how mathematics and physics should interact with biology. And um, uh, these are uh, just a, a couple of um, a pointers that I wanted to, to, to make. Um, so uh, the, the first one comes from my friend Rob Phillips at Caltech, who's a condensed matter theorist turned biologist. And uh, uh, he talks here about the distinction between doing figure one theory or figure seven theory. And what he was trying to say here is that the traditional way in which theory gets used in biology is that the biologists do a bunch of experiments. Uh, and the experimental data comprises figures one up to six. And then at the end, uh, they get together with a bunch of physicists or mathematicians and they make a model. And they show that the model accounts for their data. And that becomes figure seven. And they can submit their paper to a high impact journal and everyone goes home happy. Okay, and what Rob is saying is that, well, perhaps there's actually something else we can also do, which is to try and understand the conceptual landscape that leads biologists to make those kinds of experiments in the first place and get behind the data and use theory to drive experiments and to suggest new kinds of experiments. So the point here is that data and biologists, biologists to experimentalists, data is sacred, right? But data comes with biases. They may say unbiased way of doing things. It's never unbiased, right? It's always biased. It's just a different set of biases. And it's not just the fact that particular experimental methods are biased. It's also the fact that we decide to do certain kinds of experiments. And we decide not to do other kinds of experiments. Why? Now, the reasons why are locked up in biology's head. And they're often the result of you know, long historical processes that are going on in the field which are mostly invisible unless you're inside it. And what Rob is saying is we need to take those assumptions out and give them a shaking. And by doing that, we might be able to understand the conceptual landscape that lies behind the data. We might be able to use that to help us to think better about new kinds of experiments. And Bernd, uh, who has been uh, uh, stimulus to all of us, um, ha talks here to an audience of pure mathematicians about the vexed question of whether, in fact, there are theorems in biology. And I think, clearly, they are. We've seen some of them uh, in this conference. Um, and I think this conceptual space behind the data is a place where, actually, the pure mathematician's way of approaching the world in terms of being careful about the right axioms, the right concepts, the right terminology, the right notation, is actually critical for understanding what we do. And this is not to say that data is not important. They're fabulous questions and intellectual excitement around data, as we've seen in this conference. But there's also this other space, and this has been much less explored. OK, and finally, we tend to come to biology, particularly if you come from maths and physics, with this idea that you know, we make these models, we're describing reality. No. If we were solving Schrodinger's equation for the cell, maybe. But what we do is we make phenomenological models. So what we're really doing is writing down our assumptions about what we think is going on in reality. And there's a real distinction between those two things. OK, so pe sometimes people don't like this because it gives a sense of contingency. And it is a contingent process. The assumptions we make depend on the questions we're looking at, the data we have available, the experimental techniques that are possible at the time. And these all change over time. So this is a moving target. So what I'm going to discuss here is not the foundation or anything like that. It's only a starting point. Okay. Okay. So.
let's see if we can uh, get into the mathematics. So, um, so the way we approach uh, these problems is through um, something which we've come to call the linear framework, and uh, this actually arose not in this context, but in the context that Alicia was talking about in her talk. But for the purposes of what we're going to look at in genes, I think it's simpler to think about it in the following way. It's just a graph-based way of doing Markov processes, okay? So we have a graph, and this graph is a way of describing what's happening on DNA. The vertices are microstates. They're just, if you like, pictures of what's on DNA. But the level of resolution or abstraction is up to us. And um, this example, the level of abstraction is just, we're looking at the transcription factors. Here, just there's two. Um, and the polymerase, which is the machinery that makes mRNA, those are the levels of abstraction that we're using. Um, so we basically have three sites and eight microstates present here. So little n is the number of sites, transcription factor sites. Capital N here is the number of microstates that are present. So those are the states. Then we have transitions between these states, which are happening stochastically as a result of the binding and unbinding of these various quantities. And then we have labels. And the labels are the important things here because they are rates, so they have dimensions of inverse time. Um, and the way to think about this from the Markov process point of view is that they're just the infinitesimal rates for the Markov process. Okay, and I've just rewritten that there and you can read it, okay? Um, now, the thing about the, 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 these labels is that the labels encode how this graph is interacting with the environment in which it's in. And so, for instance, if we have a transcription factor L, which is going to bind here, then its concentration, free concentration, becomes part of the label. Now, in general, what's going on in the environment of this graph could be very complicated. And so the label could itself be very complicated to capture that. And I'm going to perhaps touch on that a bit later, but for the moment, we're going to simplify things and just assume that it's a constant, okay? Just to keep things simple. But in principle, a lot of the interesting stuff kind of happens in this interplay between the environment and the labels. Okay, so if you have a graph like this, then you can derive the master equation of the Markov process in a very simple way. You treat the graph as if it's a one-dimensional chemical system. Each edge is a chemical reaction, and you use mass action kinetics with the label as the rate. Now, if you do that, the dynamics is clearly linear because every edge has only one source, so there's no nonlinearity. So I can write it in matrix form, and the matrix that I get is precisely the Laplacian matrix of the graph. And I have a horrible feeling that I wrote that back to front, this, this matrix has column sums, which are zero, not row sums. Apologies. It was late. Um, so this master equation describes the time evolution of the probabilities. The bold here is a vector for the probabilities of the microstates. Okay? Now, this is a completely general relationship. If you have any continuous time, finite state Markov process, which is well-defined enough that it has infinitesimal rates, you can construct the graph. And the Laplacian matrix of this graph gives the master equation of the Markov process. So we're just doing Markov processes using graphs. And the Markov process people only very occasionally bring this graph into play. Okay? All right, so what are we trying to do here? We're trying to do this steady state time scale separation that Hopfield used originally. So we want to bring this uh, master equation to steady state, and we want to work out its steady state. So it turns out you can do that very nicely through the matrix tree theorem. So um, if the graph is strongly connected, we all know what that means, so I won't bother to tell you, the kernel of the Laplacian is one-dimensional. And you can make a distinguished element in the kernel of the Laplacian through the matrix tree theorem. This is just a, a restatement of that. At microstate i, the uh, ith component of this uh, kernel, canonical kernel element is given by taking a spanning tree rooted at i, multiplying all its labels, and adding up that over all the spanning trees rooted at i. Okay? And I presume I don't have to, to expand that for people here, right? Okay. So this gives us 
this distinguished kernel element, if I have a steady state, it's some scalar multiple of that. And we can account for that by just normalizing it out, remembering that probabilities add to one. And this gives us an expression for the steady state probability of the Markov process as a rational function of the edge labels. And now the way we typically explain a gene regulation function, this input-output relationship between transcription factors and the output, is to take the output to be proportional to, if you like, the probability that the polymerase is present. Okay, it's called the occupancy hypothesis. It's questionable, but we can get into that another time. So this we consider as a function of whatever the transcription factors are in this example, it's this transcription factor L, and X here, the independent variable, is the concentration. Okay? All right. So that's fine. We can do this for any graph. What happens at equilibrium? Well, at equilibrium, um, we have detailed balance. So what does that mean? So it means, first of all, that the graph is reversible. Right? If I can go from microstate I to J, I must be able to take the reverse transition, not just any old transition, but the reverse transition from J to I. And if I have a pair of reversible edges, this is the magic. They basically behave as if they're disconnected from the rest of the graph. All right, if I take a steady state, the flux from I to J is balanced against the flux from J, probability flux from I to J is balanced against the flux from J to I. It's as if this pair of reversible edges doesn't see anything around it except for the steady state. That's the only thing that ties all this together. So this, this detailed balance property is a very deep and fundamental result in physics. If you ask the physicist where it comes from, it's time reversal symmetry of the laws of physics. It's highly non-trivial, okay? So this is kind of the magic that happens at thermodynamic equilibrium, and the consequences are we have another basis element that we can write down in the kernel of the Laplacian, it's much simpler. All I need to do is to take a reference vertex, take any path of reversible edges to the vertex, I, the microstate I have in mind, and take the product of the label ratios along that path. And this is what I mean when I say we calculate probabilities by paths, okay? At equilibrium, I take any path, and detailed balance ensures that this gives the same answer all the time, okay? So we have this much simpler way of calculating the steady state, and this is, hopefully you can see what the distinction is between path independence and path dependence. When you're away from equilibrium, you have to revert back to the matrix tree theorem, and the matrix tree theorem is saying that all the paths matter, and the MTT is giving the bookkeeping for doing that calculation. Okay, so this is path independence at equilibrium versus path dependence away from equilibrium. And I think if you know anything about spanning trees in graphs, the implications of this might begin to seem quite serious. Okay, okay so I just wanted to point out that another way of looking at detailed balance is this cycle condition which is that if you take any cycle in the graph of reversible edges, the product of the labels going one way is the same as the product of the labels going other way, and this is a binomial relation. And those of you who know about toric varieties will know how interesting this is. This has been exploited in the, uh, in the context of biochemical reaction networks, but not so much in the context of the distinction between equilibrium and non-equilibrium systems. And I think this could be very useful. All right, so i just leave it out there. That's a Okay, so just a quick um, uh, reminder that uh, in the equilibrium context, what I've just told you is equivalent to equilibrium statistical mechanics. So if you go to a physics class and you do equilibrium statistical mechanics, what the physicist will do will say, here are the microstates, these are the Boltzmann factors with the free energy, and we write down a partition function, and that's how we get the probabilities of the steady states. There's no graph. Why is there no graph? The physicists hate the graph. There's a good reason for that, because for them, the independent parameters at equilibrium are the free energies of the states. Once you bring the graph edges into play, you introduced 
algebraic relationships among the labels. Of course, because that's what the cycle condition is telling us. There are algebraic relationships among the labels. Okay? They hate that. Why would you do that when you have this nice independent set of parameters? It's the free energy of the state. So this has been a, a source of much contention in our group where I have a lot of physicists. Um, and I would say there's a kind of armed neutrality on this point. Okay? <laughs> So we're still trying to convince them that there's a value in doing this at equilibrium. Right? But the real value, of course, comes away from equilibrium. OK, so um, let me not uh, detain us with this. I just wanted to point out sort of issues which we can fill in, particularly with regard to the labels and also the fact that we're kind of ignoring a lot of the complexity of expression of how polymerase machinery actually works. And we need to sort of bring those together. But uh, just, I don't want to run out of time, so let me just sort of um, skate over this. I wanted to say a few words about the fact that, in some ways, we're not doing anything new here. We're sort of bringing together lots of things that people have done in the past. This is a, the matrix tree theorem has been rediscovered so many times independently in all of these disciplines. And often with people not being aware that people down the hall are doing it, right? So it's been rediscovered independently twice in biology. Except if you read that, you, it will take you some time to figure out that they're usually, actually, it's the matrix tree theorem because they have a completely different language for talking about it. Okay, so um, what we've been really trying to do with this framework is to, 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 find, to, to bring all this together and to take advantage of all the different things that people have used in different places and Schnackenberg here is a very interesting example because he's aware of all these previous bits of work and he's a physicist and he's in non-equilibrium physics and somehow the work that he did back then in the 70s just dropped out of sight. And if you talk to a really good non-equilibrium statistical mechanics guy, they'll say, person, uh, they'll say, um, yeah, Schnackenberg, he did this network theory back in the 70s and they don't know what's going on. So somehow this graph mentality that Schnackenberg had got lost, okay? And, and it got lost away from equilibrium where we have this beautiful description of the non-equilibrium steady state. Why did that happen? I'm perplexed, okay? So uh, I have, a, I have a, a suspicion, but maybe we'll come to that later. Okay, so back to gene regulation functions. So, um, so we have this input-output relationship. We have this machinery that allows us to calculate this as a rational function. And now what we want to do is to go back and ask about sharpness. And what we're not going to do is to use Hill coefficients, which I loathe because it's a form of fitting, right? So we should do some measure of, of sharpness that is intrinsic to the function itself. And the one we're going to do is sketched out here. We're going to normalize the gene regulation function in the same way that the experimental data was normalized to its half maximal value. This is kind of subtle because the normalization depends on the function. It's not independent of the function, okay? And that's important. And we're gonna do, we use two measures of, sh of, of sharpness. And this is essential because the Hill coefficient really is not sufficient to give you insight into what's really going on here. And the two measures are to take the derivative, to look at its maximal, uh, the maximum of the derivative and the position of the maximum of the derivative and this is a position and steepness. Sorry for, we, we started using these terms and we couldn't stop, right, the bad words. Okay, so I'm going to show you plots of position and steepness for gene regulation functions for um, a transcription factor which we assume to be an activator. And the only reason we do this is because we want the gene regulation function to be monotone, so there's only one sharpness to look at, okay? All right, so what, so, so I'm sorry, there's a lot on this graph, but I want to just uh, un unpick important parts, forget about the blue bits. I didn't have access to the original file, so I wasn't able to take them out. But um, what we're seeing here on a position steepness plot, the magenta line here is the locus of position and steepness for the Hill functions, okay? X to the H over one plus X to the H. And the crosses mark the integer values of the Hill coefficient. These black dots that we see here are actual data um, these are, each individual point comes from an individual embryo, um, and this has been set up so that we're pretty sure, as sure as one can be in biology, that what's going on with what we're looking at is, is what's described in the model, okay? So without going into too much detail. And you'll see that they're clustered around here with the average 
Well, again, very close to the position and steepness of the Hill function with Hill coefficient six. There are six transcription factor binding sites in this synthetic construct that we use. So that's also consistent with what we saw before. Now the black curve, the black curve is obtained by taking um, the, an independent um, normalized set of uh, parameters and randomly sampling them independently logarithmically. And then computing the position steepness and working out the boundary of the region. Okay, so, so we, we use algorithms to push the region out and to, to, to push it in, pull, pull it inwards. And find this, this black border, which is the region here, for that sort of parametric range. Now, what we find, first of all, is that there's this cusp that falls on the hill line. Okay? And if we push this parameter range, what we find is that these boundaries um, stabilize. There's an asymptotic boundary. And what happens is the cusp gets closer and closer to six, but it never gets beyond that. Um, you, uh, so, so, so you can see that the asymptotic boundary is actually very close to what I'm plotting here. If you can't see that slide, just take my word for it. Um, so what we find is that at thermodynamic equilibrium, the, uh, the position and steepness of these gene regulatory functions is confined to this region. There's an inaccessible region, and in particular, the Hill function of coefficient six is at the tip of the cusp, okay? So there's a barrier. Is it, in fact, a Hopfield barrier? So to answer that, I have to tell you what happens away from equilibrium, and I'd love to be able to do that for n equals six sites. In fact, we can't. So what I'm gonna show you is n equals two sites, and we'll come back to why we can't in a moment. So what we're seeing here is the plot I showed you on the previous slide now for two transcription factor sites and polymerase. It has a cusp, it's not really very clear there, it's obscured by the hill line, but that cusp is where we expect it to be, it's just below hill coefficient two. And this is very close to the asymptotic boundary at thermodynamic equilibrium, but now, what we find is that away from equilibrium, and we sample those parameters in such a way that we didn't allow them to get out of hand compared to the equilibrium ones, and certainly not compared to the asymptotic boundary. And as you can see, it goes way further. Okay? And gets out, also has a cusp, but now near Hill coefficient four. So what we find here is that there is indeed a hot field barrier for sharpness. And it turns out that if you have a transcriptional activator on N sites, then the Hopfield barrier for sharpness is the Hill coefficient with coefficient N. So the Hill, coef the Hill function with coefficient N. The Hill function, which was this sort of, just something we used to fit the data, re-emerges as a Hopfield barrier. Uh, now, I put the theorem in quotation marks because we're still struggling to prove this. It's horrible. Um, and I think we need some new ideas to actually try and pin this down. But let me just explain what's going on, and you might already have sort of got a hint of this from, this is where path dependence begins to bite. Okay, so if you're at thermodynamic equilibrium, this is what the gene regulation function looks like, and we're looking at the highest order term. Okay, so what is the highest order term? If the N transcription factor binding sites, every time transcription factor binds, you get a concentration term coming into your microstate. And you're at equilibrium, so it doesn't matter what happens on other paths because any path works. So the highest degree is clearly n, where n is the number of sites. All right, so we get a rational function that looks like this, but what happens away from equilibrium? Now all bets are off, now the matrix tree theorem applies, and now the degree of this uh, gene regulation function no longer depends on the number of sites, it depends on the number of microstates. So you get this combinatorial explosion in the degree. Two minutes? Thanks. Okay. Um, and this is the driving force behind this Hopfield barrier. Okay? All right. So um, I just wanted to flash this up to say what I think is going on here is something much deeper than this particular example. I think this is really a statement about 
what happens at thermodynamic equilibrium, and that somewhere in the background there, we can look at any kind of graph involving gene regulation graph. Um, we can ca calculate these gene regulation functions, which may, be, may be functions of many variables, maybe have measures of the shape of this, which depend on the kind of information processing the gene is doing. And there's a theorem there that says, at equilibrium, these things are asymptotically bounded. There's areas where they can't reach, which you can only reach when you're away from equilibrium, okay? So I think somewhere in the background, something like this is going on. Okay, so I just wanted to, <laughs> to <laughs> finish up by pointing out just exactly how bad this problem of path dependence is. If you work with spanning trees in graphs, this will not come as a surprise. It was a big surprise when we found out that going from n equals two sites to n equals three sites does that to the number of spanning trees. Okay, so we can calculate two. There is no way anyone is going to calculate three. <laughs> All right, so this uh, is in fact, I think the fundamental problem we have here. And this problem has essentially been ignored within the physics literature. What the physicists do when they see this, they recoil with horror, okay? And, and they approximate. They throw away most of the spanning trees and say, okay, this, it only depends on these. And Hockfield's paper is a beautiful example of this. You assume that that is low and this is high and you ignore this and out it comes, okay? And that's the physicist's art. But to me as a mathematician, this is saying, hang on a minute, what is going on here? And what is going on here in biology, because in biology is precisely the place where you expect that it's lots of little things that contribute to make the phenotype. It's not a few dominant things, okay? So what we are faced with is, uh, is this problem that in physics we've been sort of looking under the street lamp, okay, where the light is available. And there's this darkness out there which is this combinatorial explosion that comes from the matrix tree theorem, and it's been ignored, right? And when I want to annoy my physics friends, I tell them, you've been searching under the street light, and they really don't like that. <laughs> okay. All right, so um, the, the bottom line here is that having, having tried to get to grips with, I think, a fundamental problem in biology, which is how genes are working, what we discover is that actually we have to solve problems in physics in order to do that. So we find ourselves fighting on two fronts. And if you're a student of history, you know that that's a bad place to be. So help, okay? All right, let me just thank my uh, colleague, Angela de Pace at Harvard, who's a Drosophila geneticist and was the starting point for all these conversations about how genes work. And the people who did the work, Jihei Park was the person who did that experimental data that I showed you. And these are some of the others. That's my uh, group and some of the students who've helped in developing the linear framework. I'm sorry to have gone on for a bit longer than I should have, but thank you very much for your patience. Hey, thanks very much, Jeremy. Um, I really don't want to throw this box, um, but <laughs> some of questions? I'm scared to throw it. Ask questions, but I'll just run it to you. Okay, I have um, I have a couple questions actually. The first, oh, good. I don't have to do that. <laughs> um, but one question I had was, do you think that there is some hope that this combinatorial explosion that there is some smaller subset to look at than the forty-two? I, I do, okay. uh, but I think uh, one of the um, one of the issues here is that we kind of need to bring the physicist's insights to bear on how to break up that combinatorial complexity because at the moment it just looks like a, a mess. It's just a C. And I think it's only in the last year or so that through a, a lot of very um, interesting conversations within our group that some ideas have started to emerge for that. So I'm hopeful, but I think the problem is that weirdly, People have not been thinking about this from the physics point of view. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Okay, let's thank Jeremy again. Thank you. Oh, there, sorry, there's one announcement. Uh, so he'll put, he'll put up uh, a slide. This is about next June, 
For those of you don't, that don't like to sleep in the summer, um, when there is all light up north, there are three events in uh, Norway and Sweden next June. The first is uh, in Tromsø, the second is in Stockholm, and the third is in Norfjord, um, Norway. And there is a week between the second and third, so that's when you explore the rest of, of the two countries. <laughs> Make a note, and there will be more announcements, of course, uh, as we approach. Thank you.